There we go. So um, this month is using ergonomics to help beat the heat. So you know, heat stress, heat exhaustion. It is definitely, probably, definitely, probably, <laughs> a topic that comes up quite frequently in your safety talks and in your health and safety program. And it may not be something that people realize has an ergonomic impact, or ergonomics, vice versa, has a has an impact towards reducing heat exposure. So going forward, this session is basically going to just kind of highlight some basic anatomy principles to kind of keep in mind. I know we kind of have a tendency to get kind of detail-oriented about a few facts when it comes to heat stress. We talk about heat stress, stroke, and heat exhaustion. We know that the consequences can be, could be death, so they're quite severe. But at the end of the day, understanding some of the anatomical reasons why kind of help move us to some of our problem-solving techniques and maybe how we're addressing heat currently. We could maybe improve on that or extrapolate something different so that our program is just a little bit more robust. And not only are we preventing um, all of the illnesses and consequences of heat, but we may actually be able to help improve the productivity and capacity of our workers. So our agenda today is quite simple. We're going to just look at some of the risk factors, which should be kind of review for most of us. We're going to look at, again, that anatomy of heat. What is our body's response to it? How are we able to kind of thermoregulate so that we're able to maintain not just a healthy status, but an optimal capacity as far as doing physical work. Then we'll look at the physical and cognitive capacity when in heat or, or while working in heat and, um, and into those ergonomic interventions and program steps we can look at. So our first one is really, you know, as I said, very much review. It's looking at those risk factors. And as you can see kind of from the, the, the pictogram, it kind of goes through some of the symptoms, shall we say, of what an employee should be feeling when they're starting to be exposed to high levels of heat. And for those of you that aren't in Canada, Canada is known for, you know, yes, it's cold winters, but we are currently just came out of a, re a relative high heat wave and are about to go into another high heat wave where humidity is up, temperatures are high, and, you know, the the relief from that heat is potentially minimal depending on your workplace, your work organization, or the environment your workers are being exposed to. So we kind of flux in and flux out of these high heat situations, which puts us in a position where we're kind of sometimes running after the ball. And that means kind of we have low, we have great temperatures, we have ideal work environments one day, and as I said, the next week, I think today, it starts today, is when the heat is supposed to go up again. You know, we're then scrambling to make sure that we have all of our protocols in place. And some of those protocols may be easier to administer than others. So if, for instance, giving out freezies and um, Gatorade is part of your program, but your crew is in a you know, off-site field worker and getting access to them is somewhat challenging and we're not prepared for that, then that part of your program maybe starts to fall. And the individuals that are going to be most at risk are some of those that have general low physical fitness, that lack of acclimati acc acclimation, and in Canada sometimes that's challenging because as I said, we go from very, very cold temperatures to quite, quite hot. So the spectrum in which our temperatures flow is quite radical compared to some of the more temperate areas in the world. So our surface to mass ratio or our weight, age, fatigue, if you've had prior heat illness, you are definitely more susceptible to experiencing um, physiological and psychological limitations in heat coming, coming up, as well as what is your hydration status. So all of these things are kind of things that we may or may not have it be able to control or be able to put any impact as to you know, minimizing these risk factors because they really are dependent on the employee. But at the end of the day, it's important to realize who our high-risk individuals are so that 
again, our plan of attack is a little bit more fine-tuned and a little, little bit regulated. So when we're looking at the anatomy of heat and how kind of our body goes about getting that thermal regulation, it, we, we have a body temperature at rest of 37 degrees. And so 37 degrees sounds fine, but what people don't realize, or maybe you do, um, is that it doesn't take, you know, it's not 10 degrees that we're looking at before we start seeing issues. We start seeing effects, physical and cognitive effects, within one degree of our resting body temperature. So our body kicks in, our hypothalamus starts to work, and it sends out signals so that we produce sweat. And that allows us to create kind of moisture evaporating off the skin, which helps dilate and cool the skin. Our blood vessels dilate to try and bring the blood closer to the skin. So again, it can take um, the best benefit from that moisture evaporation and cooling effect. We have hydration and salt levels will kind of be used to help create that sweat production, but also will be depleted. The more we sweat, the longer we sweat. So we can actually get into a phase where we can't sweat anymore, and therefore our sweat production stops, and our vasodilation still continues, but we're bringing blood to the surface, but there's no ability to cool that blood. The other important aspect, and it really becomes a significant part of this conversation, is the fact that our internal metabolic heat actually produces its own heat. So as we work, the muscles in our body create you know, kinetic, kinetic energy, and that energy has a byproduct of heat itself. So regardless of what is happening outside, we know that you know, we could go to the gym in an air conditioning environment and we could still be sweating because that internal metabolic heat production is very high because our physical movement, our work that we're doing with our muscles is high as well. So when we have those two elements both being high, that's usually when we start to see breakdowns in our body's ability to regulate and our body's ability to do work. So we kind of have this occupational heat exposure kind of system going. We have that external heat. And when we talk about external heat, we definitely have humidity. We have the ambient air temperature. We have radiant heat from the sun. Um, we may also have uh, you know, heat that's being caused by clothing that we're wearing. And then we have that internal heat, whereas if we're doing low capacity work, our body temperature should be lower, but if our job requirements require us to be very physical, then our internal heat is going to go up. So as soon as we have a combination of both of those, heat stress becomes a very serious concern. And when we're looking at heat stress as far as health and safety, we're very much concerned about those heat exhaustion, heat stress, heat um, heat stroke that you know could end up being almost a critical injury but before we even get to that point there's an ergonomic conversation that should be happening so yes we're concerned about the health and safety of the employee based on the heat but when we're looking at production outputs that's where the ergonomic conversation comes in because there's physiological and psychological changes that don't just move you into that clinical health risk zone, but have a very high diminished rate of capacity. So what that means is we physically don't have the output. Our body is working so hard to try and cool its internal temperature that the resources we have left to put into our muscles and into our, our mind to do work effectively becomes very limited and very exhausted. So that's when we start seeing, yes, we have the clinical health risks of heat stroke, exhaustion, all of those ones. We have negative impact to potential already existing illnesses or chronic conditions of the employees. But when we talk about that human capacity element, that's when we start to see other risks, uh, accident risks happening. So our mental capacity may not be there. So our attention to detail, that's when kind of our I don't want to say silly mistakes, but our just you know our attention is just not where it should be, and in a split second we've done something that causes an accident. That yes, 
in your our incident reports, it may not come down to heat being the issue because that's not how our accident investigation goes. It was a lack of attention, but that a lack of attention could have been a direct result of the fact that we're working in very high temperatures. And then also the adverse effect is, again, we have that reduced capacity for physical performance. We're not able to put out what we once were two days ago when our temp, you know, we had a nice cool breeze and uh, temperatures were 22 and that's kind of our ideal working conditions. We didn't have those kind of happening. So when we're looking at, well, again, slide don't want to move. Bear with me. Unfortunately, my technical abilities result primarily on just clicking random buttons on my, on my computer screen. So when we're looking at kind of our rates of where we're going to have injury, you can kind of see here. So at 28 degrees, which is almost 10 degrees below our internal body temperature, so this is our effective temperature, we are still looking at percent, potentially an 8% loss of productivity, um, but typically our mental facilities are not being impacted at that stage. When we start getting into 28, 29 degrees, you see that our productivity is starting to drop even more. We're almost at a 20% drop for productivity, and we've got a 5% drop in accuracy. By the time we get up to 38 degrees, um, and that's not necessarily considering you know, your wet bulb index, so it may not be considering humidity, um, but we start to see the 62% drop in productivity and up to 700% in our mental capacity. So that's something to be very aware of. So yes, we are, are struggling to keep up with our regular work pace at these high temperatures, but we really start to have like some some confusion, some lightheadedness, our mental capacity in high heat, you can see, drops considerably lower than our physical. So although it starts at zero, whereas our productivity kind of is, oh, starts at an 8% drop, we, we go up much quicker, much higher exponentially on our, on our loss at accuracy. So we may start seeing things where, you know, hammers hit hands, uh, fingertips get very close to blades, if not in the way of blades. Um, and our quality is going to go down too. If we start to see a loss in accuracy of 300%, even 40%, we may, not, we may start having more errors and more assembly issues if that's our process and we start to see a loss in those regards. So this is kind of a really kind of impactful slide as far as Yes, we know we want to prevent heat, stress, exhaustion, and stroke, but if we're sitting here trying to, trying to also get work done and we're maybe having days of poor quality, a lot of errors, a lot of waste, this also could be brought into your heat program that you're having in your health and safety pro, um, kind of department. So kind of impactful as to what, how our body relates to heat and the capacity of our physical and our cognitive facilities. So moving into how are we going to control them. So some of these I know for sure if you have high temperatures in your organization, whether it be you are a foundry, whether you are a construction or kind of field worker element or you have ovens, you know, heat stress is going to be something that's on your radar pretty much from anywhere June to September in Canada anyways, and if you're in other places of the world, potentially year-round. But some of the things to consider or reconsider would be definitely how are we scheduling work? And I know we try desperately to do this as best we can, um, but asking the question, are we allowing when those temperatures get up to that, you know, 37, 38, even 32 degrees, are we allowing our employees to somehow self-pace our work? Are we regulating the production demands to kind of reflect the fact that they're not 
employees are not physically capable of keeping up with what they may be were able to with temperatures much lower. Are we providing the rest and hydration breaks? Because as I said earlier, um, the more sweat we produce, we do get to a point when we're getting towards that very extreme um, result or risk of, of, of heat where we just don't have the hydration or the electrolytes in our body to produce sweat to the same degree and that's when our body temperature really starts to spike and that thermal regulation just breaks down and is not able to happen to the way it should. So are we having those rest and hydration breaks and what are we encouraging our employees to use as, rest, as hydration? Are we encouraging water? Are, you, are they allowed to drink whatever they want? So maybe soft drinks or juice, which seem good, but um, may not have the nutrients that we ideally would want for optimal hydration. I mean, water, some of your electrolyte drinks probably are your better options. Um, do your employees have the ability to rotate their tasks? So if I'm able to kind of go from, okay, this is a very physical, very heavy task, I'm going to do this for 10 minutes, but then I have some inspection work I need to do, some quality work, maybe some cleanup, things that are just slightly lower, slower pace, Lower, lower physicality that's going to allow me to kind of just balance how my body's reacting to these extreme temperatures. And if that's not available per se, are we able to kind of, from a supervisor's standpoint, schedule the work better? Ideally, you know, you see a lot of, you know, roofing companies and, and such that, you know, they'll, they would rather start really early in the morning and work to let's say 10, 30, 11 and then break for a big chunk of the afternoon and day and then come back and start work later on when it's maybe less, the temperatures are less high and that humidity maybe is a little bit lower. So looking at some of these scheduling controls can definitely help the body's ability to maintain that thermal regulation for longer before the systems start to break down and we start kind of going into that very high risk health zone that we want to avoid. But being able to do this kind of before we get to that should allow your productivity rates to at least be, we're at least getting productive work out of our employees. We're not necessarily constantly in that kind of rest hydration break kind of cycle. I am not sure why I have such a delay here. So the other thing to be considerate of is protective clothing. So thick protective clothing is going to prevent sweat from evaporating off, which is the body's main response to be able to regulate our temperature. Being able to evaporate that, that moisture off of our skin is our number one and most effective ability of cooling ourselves down. And if we prevent that from happening, even though those protective clothing are, prevent, are you know, protecting us from other safety elements, we have no other expectation other than to understand that the internal temperature while performing work is going to go up because we've just prevented one of the kind of anatomies of heat um, from happening. So looking to breathable clothing, I know that's kind of a bit, we all know this, um, but what are we defining as breathable clothing? Clothing. So you know, if you go online, cotton is actually one of the number one, they say natural fibers is the best to actually wear in high heat. But cotton, specifically some of our thicker cottons, which is often what our work material or work clothing is made of, sometimes can be actually not, lost of word here, um, not as beneficial, let's say, as some of our, our other materials. So we're starting to see, even though they're polyester, but our dry fits and our quick, quick breathing, our perforated kind of materials may be actually more beneficial than cotton. And the reason is, is cotton is fabulous for absorption. So it will very much absorb some of that kind of sweat and whatnot off the body, but we actually want that to be on the body longer. And when cotton gets wet, it expands and it actually creates a tighter seal. So getting that airflow through our clothing becomes limited. So again, 
We may have thought cotton is a great one, and it's not bad. I'm not saying that, but I am saying there may be other items where that offer a quicker drying system that not only kind of absorb the sweat and don't dry, cotton doesn't dry overly quick, which means that sweating clothing may be sticking to the body, which means we are now not letting that airflow and circulation cool the wetness on our body and getting that cooling that we need internally. So just kind of food for thought. Cotton's often one of the ones that everyone thinks to go to, and depending on the thickness of it, the thicker cottons actually become quite, quite warm in high humidity and high heat because of that absorption of, the, of water and inability to actually allow air to circulate around the body. So, and that's the second point. Our loose fitting clothing is a must. So if you are working in areas where maybe additional clothing is where be needing to be worn, I was uh, yesterday in a plant where I had to put on like scrubs or a Tyvek suit, that type of thing, and they, they said to me, try and go a couple of sizes up so that you have room. I was going to be in very high humidity rooms in the, in the organization and they were like go go bigger and that way it allows that air circulation so although we think you know sometimes you know that gym mentality creeps in and we all those tight clothing but the tight clothing is really it gets out of our way but isn't as effective at cooling our body so one of the kind of ways of looking this at this example was if we have a job that requires low effort, so we're saying about 30% of our physical capacity of what we're able to do, if we have high temperatures, then that could increase to or decrease our physical effort by 84%. So simply by wearing heavy heat, the, the study that was these numbers were coming from, we're looking at the firefighting clothing that having to wear, and even just kind of walking through an environment with no physical requirements, that 30% at almost rest was now increased to 84% of our capacity because our body was having to work so hard just to try and stay cool. As I said, there is nothing more to give to kind of those muscles to do the physical work that they may need to do. So we need to kind of look at clothing as definitely being a solid foundation to our program and how are we going to react to that. Oops, sorry. Obviously, our environmental controls are a challenge. If your industry is such that um, you produce a lot of heat, chances are you are not putting air conditioning in that facility because it's kind of money down the drain. So looking at ways of very much increasing that air circulation. That air circulation is a fundamental component of how we stay cool. So being able to do that is really key. But also looking at ways of kind of shielding or providing a guard against that radiant heat. If you know that you have pipes or furnaces or ovens that are just pumping out the heat, how can we maybe isolate that heat? And that's something we don't see as regularly in a lot of the clients that we work with or a lot of industries actually that we work with is we kind of just throw our hands up and say this is the nature of the beast. But if your work environment is such that heat is a is a concern year round, then looking at some of these controls where we're shielding that radiant heat may help bring down the ambient temperature so that our body's better able to perform physical work in that environment. So this one is definitely looking at kind of your design. And it really is something we don't necessarily think about, but once you do, it really does make common sense. And it's trying to minimize unnecessary movement, unnecessary work. If we are looking at better work designs so that our body's not kind of bent over, if you could imagine kind of our picture on the side, if he was doing this kind of on the ground or at low working heights, then that's a lot of muscular effort to try and do that and sustain that. But if we're able to bring work up, whether it's working on the tailgate of your truck, using height adjustable options, whether it be saw horses that are just raising equipment up, um, height adjustable tables, if it's in your work environment that you're able to do that. But trying to look at the working heights of our employees so that they are A, 
um, at a height that's going to allow us to maintain the most neutral posture possible for as long as possible. Because as soon as we move, we know. You know, I'm sure all of us last week were like just wanted to stay still and have a fan blowing on us because as soon as you moved, you would break out into that sweat and you could actually feel your body kind of working harder to try and go, oh, we gotta, we got to cool this, this movement down. Um, and then looking at some of our assistive tools and devices. So if you have field workers, definitely these height adjustable or lift gates are wonderful so that people aren't manually lifting things out, the kind of bringing or dragging with a lower physical effort to the tailgate, and the tailgate's actually doing the, the higher physical component of the job. If you're looking at you know, uh, my, our food industries with our ovens, then looking at conveyors to transport, all these things that we kind of look at as part of an efficiency and ergonomic and productivity component, these things really start to be hugely impactful for the employee, yes, during your general work environments, but definitely when heat is involved because now the employee is actually able to sustain just a more neutral, more still posture so the muscles aren't physically having to work, which is what we all want to do in high, high temperatures. This is kind of really more of your safety one, and I find most of my organizations do really well on this. And this is your training control. At the end of the day, um, people acclimate differently. They're going to respond differently. So allowing them to be their kind of their own mental gauge as to how are they feeling, how are we working, each exhaustion and heat stroke so that they can start doing some of these things that we talked about. Maybe they need to have a heat break. Maybe they need to kind of look at how they're working or slow down the work pace that they may be working at or find some shade to work in instead of, you know, shade moves. So I may have started out in the shade and I may not need to, but I haven't moved and this I'm not feeling very well. I need to move my workstation. Um, working in pairs, asking for help. All of these things are things that our workers may not be doing until it's too late because they're not aware of the effects of heat and they may not be aware of what they need to do. Understanding that you know an improved ergonomic design of their workstation, so bringing things closer to them because it requires less reach. On a good day, that may not matter to them because, I don't know, they're tall and strong and reaching is not a big problem every day. But on a very hot, humid day where we're having those heat concerns, that reach is going to have an internal metabolic component that is going to increase their internal temperature and potentially lower their physical capacity or their mental capacity, and we don't want that to happen. So that training component becomes really key so that they can be this kind of own litmus test and understand when they need to maybe do, do things differently, really. So at the end of the day, what we're looking at is, as I said earlier, a lot of you probably already have fairly long-standing heat programs. And maybe you've gone through and all of this stuff is like, yes, we have that. Yes, we're doing that. Yes, 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 yes. And that's fabulous and we'd love to hear that. But often what we'll see is heat programs are kind of put in fairly rapidly and when, when the summer comes, especially in Canada anyways, and we rely on the breaks and the hydration and we may not be expanding past that. So this may be an opportunity as we're about to go into heat wave number two of for, for us here in Canada and look at what is our program doing? Is it actually combating heat the way we would want to to allow people not just to get not get sick because obviously that is a very good goal, but we also want to ask the question, is our program, heat program allowing us to really maximize the physical and mental capacity of our employees? Because if we're constantly, if the result is that we are constantly just kind of our production drops and we're scrambling thereafter, we need to understand temperatures are not able to cool as well. So all systems all around have a tendency to go down. So look 
looking at some of those environmental controls, how are we able to kind of best manage those? How are we going to be able to look at scheduling, clothing, work design, and bringing each of these elements into that audit process to see where we may be doing things great, maybe where could we improve, and maybe some things that we haven't considered in the past. So review your clothing, review your workers' ability to minimize their muscular load, their ability to maintain neutral postures, and their ability to self-pace or change the work task to allow them to better kind of capitalize on when their body is going to let them do more work and when their body's not. So kind of just a food for thought going into the, the summer months and how we're kind of able to manage those as best as we possibly can. So that is pretty much it for today. Next month our webinar is on kind of mobile transient workstations, so ergonomics on the run. And it will be on August 20th at 11 a.m. So please join us then. If you are not able to attend but are interested in the topic, just register. And again, you will still be sent the um, recording afterwards. So you'll still have that information to digest whenever you are able. And if you have any questions, please send them through. I haven't been checking, so I'm not quite sure. It doesn't look like I have any, so that's okay. But if you do have any, please let us know, and we can either respond to you directly or send out a kind of global to everyone who's registered today and let you know what the question was and what the response is. I hope you all are having a fabulous summer and a safe summer, and that you're not suffering too much from the heat. Take care, and goodbye from us from ProErgonomics.